So, um, yeah, that's not me, even in my younger days. Um, David Bowie, Hunky Dory era, so pre-Ziggy Stardust. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, that is your homework for the weekend, okay? So Hunky Dory did a wonderful, well, it's a wonderful album, uh, or um, a classic song, uh, Changes. Um, so uh, I'd love to say that the keynote is by David Bowie, except that it's not. It's, it's best known for its ch 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 in the uh, uh, chorus. So I thought, let's talk about changes. I'll, I'll leave the picture of uh, Mr. Bowie there. And I want to talk about humans and code. And this seems a reasonable thing to do. There will actually be a little bit of code, not too much. I mean, you've seen more than enough of that uh, all week, and you probably get an awful lot of that on Monday as well. Or if your week has been particularly unkind to you, you'll have some when you get home, and tomorrow, and on Sunday. Um, but I want to remind you that you're human, and we need to remind ourselves of this. So I want to talk about this whole, there's a kind of a paradox, there's a contradiction in who we are and what we do. And I want to explore that and just pull in a few observations about uh, uh, change. Um, and let's start off with humans and the, uh, the late, great Grace Hopper, a uh, very inspirational individual. Uh, wonderful observation. Humans are allergic to change. They love to say, we've always done it this way. I try to fight that. That's why I have a clock on my wall that runs counterclockwise. You know, this used to be one of my favorite quotes. Well, it still is, except it just used to be a passive quote enjoyed simply and intellectually. And then I realized we live in the internet age. I wonder if I can get an anti-clockwise clock. Yes, you can. <laughs> so that's my one. It sits on my wall. My kids who are Zoomers, they can, barely, they can barely read a regular analog clock. But it's just like, my older one came in a while back and just said, oh, that really messes with the little knowledge I already have, you know? <laughs> so we have this issue with change. It's kind of like, um, and it's not even just down to humans. So one of the, one of the kind of greatest um, graphic novels ever produced, um, uh, series graphic novels, um, uh, Sandman by Neil Gaiman, there is a character, an entity, so basically not human. Um, <coughs> delirium, the clue is in her name. She's a little bit here, a little bit there. And so she asks her brother, what's the name of the word for things not being the same always? You know, I'm sure there is one, isn't there? There must be a word for it. The thing that lets you know time is happening. I think that's such a lovely way of putting it. How do you know time is happening? Now, her brother has very few words, just offers change. Delirium's response, oh, I was afraid of that. And that's the funny thing, because we work in technology. And technology is so heavily associated with change. We associate, associate it with change, we associate it with progress. We have a very simple kind of view. In fact, um, hopefully we don't still all have this simple view, but still... Within us, there is this idea that, yes, these two words live together naturally in the same sentence, and that there is no contradiction here whatsoever. And we like to always talk in terms of progress, as if there's only one arrow in one direction. And we even glorify it. And damn, do we love using certain words. Yeah? You, you cannot, you know, if you're going to try and set up a startup, you've got to be disruptive. It's got to be on one of your slides, that you're going to disrupt something, you know, even if it's the venture capitalist expe expectations. But you've got to disrupt something. Otherwise, who are you, you know, are you even doing this? Now, this term comes to us from Clayton Christensen in the mid-1990s, and I'm going to bookend the talk by returning to it. But without trying to be too technical, let's just understand what we mean by disruption. Um, no, this is not one of my books. I normally take pictures of my books. This is an early edition copy of Hemingway's Sun Also Rises. Um, I swipe this picture. It's, it's, it's not a first edition. It's about a fifth or so edition. It's two and a half thousand pounds. So no, this is not mine. But there's a wonderful description here that ca captures the essence of disruption. Uh, how did you go bankrupt? Oh, two ways. Gradually and then suddenly. And so, you know, we, 
That's what real disruption is. And everybody's going around, posturing. Oh, disruption, disruption, disruption. Then pandemic. Oh, that's what you mean by disruption. We, we had no idea. We just thought it was about taxi cabs and deliveries. Yeah. It, it, and, and just, you know, sort of commodifying a particular space. And it's just like, ah. Oh. So pandemic arrived. And there was a kind of a big collective. And then there was followed by a huge collective. And that is disruption. That is utterly transformative. And so it's kind of an interesting thing here because it was actually a test of a lot of that technology. And you probably heard loads of talks, and I'm not going to spend my time pointing this one out. But we, this was actually a very interesting test because there was a simple idea of like, well, what did this happen 10 years ago? Always look backwards. It's kind of, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting. Speculate, what would it have been like 10 years ago? Not like this. The technology wasn't quite there. We'd have done something. I've, I've had the ability, I think the first time I was, I got the opportunity to actually work from home, um, and it was part of my job description, in the office, at home, and out and about, was 1996, which is uh, going to be before a couple of you were born. And let's put it this way, we didn't have anything like we had had these days. We didn't have anything that you would call bandwidth. I mean, bandwidth, what is, what is that? You know, we, we used to use smoke signals and stuff. Um, but you can get a surprising amount of work done with smoke signals. Uh, you can still burn people, let's put it that way. That's all that matters on the internet. But the point there is that that experience is very, very different. That possibility has been there with us for ages, gradually, and then suddenly. That was, that's very much the message. I think a lot of us had used various calls, maybe for family, maybe for the odd bit of business. But then gradually, then suddenly, everything shifted. So this is the nature of change. We both kind of say, yeah, we do it, we're in technology, we're really good with it, and then we're also really, really bad with it. And we also hold it back. This is the very curious thing. So let's talk about what is it. Change is difference with respect to time. Difference is something with respect to time. An obvious one is difference of space. Okay, I'm here, and now I'm here. Okay. And we might say, okay, the difference to that, we can define that as velocity. And there is a word we love to use. There is a word we love to use. Yeah. We might be using it a little bit too much and not quite correctly. This has kind of come to us, you know, what happens is we end up with a weaponized vocabulary. Disruption is one of the words. Velocity is a word that came out of the extreme programming community. These days, I actually have to explain what that is. It was kind of one of the... Hmm. disruptive processes that ultimately uh, triggered people's interest in <coughs> what then became called agile development. Um, but this has become weaponized, and we have teams who track their velocity. I even commented on something on uh, LinkedIn where somebody said, one of the most important metrics, and I didn't comment as in, you know, kind of like tinfoil hat, anonymous ID kind of comment. It was just like, you know, that might not be that helpful, and here's a link to something else that might kind of clarify how we misuse it. Because somewhere in my past, I have a degree in physics, so I'm not going to let the word go, am I? Okay, this is speed. It's just a man of stuff. This is direction. You put the two together, and you have velocity. Now, we might use the word velocity casually in English, but given that we're in a technical domain, let us be technical and use it precisely. Because it turns out that if we were measuring velocity and we were optimizing velocity, that would be a good thing. That would be fantastic. But nobody does it. Everybody measures speed. I'm traveling 100 miles an hour. Yeah? Where are you heading? I have no idea. You, you need to be heading north. Uh, looks like I'm heading south. You're heading in the wrong direction. Yeah, but it's 100 miles per hour. You see, we might have got that wrong. And that's the whole thing. Because if we did talk about velocity, that would be valuable. Because that's direction. Are we doing the right thing in the right way? How's that going for us? I don't know, but the numbers are really big. Yeah, but you're going in the wrong direction. Yeah, but the numbers are really big. So we kind of have ended up with a weaponized version of this word. Okay? And in some circles, it's just like, this is a dirty word. Don't use that word here. It's just like, why not? We're trying to be agile. Oh, we don't, we don't like agile. What? You don't want to be able to move quickly and easily. Oh, no. 
That's not what it means. No, really, it is. I've got a, I've got a dictionary that tells me. I've checked it. Because it turns out that ad, it's an adjective. What does that mean? You can't, it means you can't do it. You can be it. And you can be more of it or less of it. It is an observation that we make on something. Oh, you know what? That is quite agile. That code base, that's quite agile. Because I can move it quickly and easily. That team, oh man, they are way more agile than they were six months ago. Look at how they respond to incidents, crises, and change. That is the meaning of the word. Apparently, it spawned an industry. Really, there's not a lot of industry in this, but there's a lot of thought. The problem is, you've got all these people who are trying to do agile, which is a noun. And it generally, they kind of pursuing quick movement, but all we end up with is busyness. And the consequence of busyness is exhaustedness. I'm legitimately claiming that as a word. The real secret to agility is that we've got this misunderstanding about its relationship to speed and change. There's this curious thing. There's a lovely book by um, Austin Kleon. Um, strongly recommend his books. Uh, he's an artist, written some really great stuff. Um, if you do anything creative, huh, coding, possibly one of the most creative things that human beings do. So just as a point for self-esteem, um, if you're in an organization and you have a division where you have a division of roles and responsibilities where you have a bunch of people called designers and they do user interface work and they are also called creatives by other people, really watch that vocabulary. We've ended up with the wrong understanding. Oh, no, I'm not creative. I just write code. <laughs> Really? You conjure something from nothing in a way that nobody else except a few witches that got burned at the stakes a few centuries ago. So that didn't work out so well. Maybe I shouldn't pursue this line. But the point there is you are doing one of the most creative things in the whole of human history. It really is an astonishingly creative thing. Just because you can't paint does not mean you're not creative. That's, so do read this book. Very inspiring. And, and an, and Cleon makes this point. It's impossible to pay proper attention to your life if you're hurtling along at lightning speed. And that's the point here. When your job is to see things other people don't, you have to slow down enough that you can actually look. And it is your job, because that's the thing about software development. The job is not merely to construct something, it's to observe the detail, because nobody else has. The whole point about software is, you know, the way sometimes people say, oh, that's just a detail. You're welcome to software. That's what a software system is. It's lots of details. There's no hand waving. There might be a hand waving like I'm doing now in front of a PowerPoint presentation, but it turns out you do that in front of a compiler, nothing happens. You have to commit to a level of detail. You are making a continuous set of decisions and exploring possibilities. You have to slow down. That's how you go fast. Okay? It sounds like a paradox, but it's not. It's like why cars have brakes. Cars have brakes not so you can slow down, but so you can go faster. It's a simple thought experiment. How fast, if I said, oh damn, I left my keys in the hotel. Just imagine I have my keys with me. Here, keys to my car. It's not that great, but it's nice, it's purple. It's a nice little Peugeot, small engine, decent mileage. Got no brakes. Oh, thanks Kevlin, I'm, f I'm fine, I'll walk. Because that's the whole point. How fast would you go if you did not have that kind of control? It turns out that most of the practices that we advocate in software development are about slowing you down. Let's do a code review, but that'll slow me down. Yeah, so you can go faster. Oh, let's write some tests. Yeah, it's going to slow me down. That's right, so you can go faster. Not in the second to second. That's not, the, that's not how software is created. We create software not in the seconds and the minutes, but over the hours and the years. That's the frame you want to go faster in. Then optimize the wrong thing. And it is your job to notice those bits and go, oh, that's funny. Well, what happens if this is the case and this is the case? You go to a product owner and it's just like, oh, we never thought of that. Or that'll never happen. At that point, you bring out your folder of things that are, that'll never happen. Yeah, yeah, I put it on Git. There it is, you say. Here's all the things people said could never happen. Now, back to that question. What happens if this happens? Yeah, that's your job. You see things other people don't. You've got to slow down for that. So it turns out that what we're interested in and all that agility stuff is change of velocity. To slow down is to decelerate. Deceleration is a form of acceleration. That's definitely a physics perspective. <sighs> Yeah, it's acceleration, just negative. But also changing of direction. 
that is also acceleration. That's what, that's what all of this stuff is about. And there's that word again, change. We can actually even find it in the original Agile Manifesto, except people kind of like went over this and go, yeah, 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 yeah. Individuals and interactions over process, yeah, yeah, we get that, that whole thing. And it spent the last two decades selling us processes and tools. And individuals are interacting with tools, which really wasn't the goal. It's the each other, the peopleness of it. This is a talk about humans and code. Software is one of the most interesting collaborative things that we do. So the phrase I want to discuss is responding to change over following a plan. Because that was the point. It is the responding to change. In other words, that's the kind of second derivative of time rather than the first. And it's not to do with the velocity or the speed. It's to do with this thing. So this gives us a rather interesting perspective. This is the first point I'm going to talk about architecture. I'll come back to architecture again. And this is real architecture, the building stuff, stuff we're in. Although this may not be the greatest example. Um, but even an architecture that you don't like is still an architecture. And this is another one of those books that's great for people who work in design-based disciplines, which, bizarrely enough, so we do. 101 Things I Learned in Architecture School. It's about half of the advice here is applicable to anybody who is designing anything of any kind and creating something to resolve a problem, address a need. And this observation Matthew Frederick makes, um, properly gaining control of the design process tends to feel like one is losing control of the design process. There is that idea, rather than saying, we commit to this, 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 on this date and that date, and this is how we're going to do it. You say, you don't shrug your shoulders and say, who knows? That, that tends not to work very well um, uh, from a kind of like uh, being popular with the management perspective. There is a difference here. What you're doing is you're saying, right, okay, we've got, we can see a number of possibilities. The future branches out from here. We could do it that way, or we could do it that way, or we can do it that way. And we've got a way to answer each of these questions. We can be methodical about it. We can ex explore the near future. But you're not committing to a single way. You are literally offering people a roadmap. When I say literally, that, that word comes in for a lot of abuse, I do mean literally offering people a roadmap, because most of the roadmaps you see in business these days are not roadmaps. I mean, they're not useful roadmaps. I mean, what would you do with a roadmap that only had one road? Why would you even need the map? Yeah, here's our product roadmap. Oh man, it's so change averse. It's just like, it's one straight line. I don't need a map if I've only got one road. That's an itinerary. It's not a map. A map shows you possibilities. It says five minutes, and these days, we get the active form of maps, okay? It's five minutes quicker this way, similar ETA that way. That's what you want. That's supposed to be how you're supposed to do design and software development as a whole, rather than committing to the, something you'd have incomplete knowledge about with absolute confidence. So we've ended up with this devaluing of how we think about software development. So the body which is called, and which still calls itself, the Holy Roman Empire, was in no way holy, nor Roman, nor an empire. This is Voltaire's observation in the late 18th century. Um, holy Roman Empire ceased to exist a few decades later. One can only hope the same for SAFE, which <sighs> scaled Agile framework is the epitome of all of that nastiness that has happened in the Agile space. It, it satisfies the Holy Roman Empire definition. It's not scale, it's, it's not agile. In fact, I even, one of my favorite comments running a workshop last year was like, oh, I was trying to get people's experience in the room. It's just, oh, yeah, we've, we've, uh, we don't do agile. And the guy meant this without irony. But he said, yeah, yeah, we're not doing agile anymore, we're using safe. There's such wisdom, <laughs> such wisdom in, in accidental phrasing. So here's a thought. We've defined the concept of process in terms of change. But Kent Beck made this observation a few years back. The moment design becomes important is when you want to change something. In other words, if you don't want to change anything, you're fine. But the minute you want to change something, that's when it matters. The problem is it's really difficult to understand that when you're actually going through it the first time, because everything's so clear, you're so confident, because you've only got one road at that point. That's why you need to keep the other roads in mind. But now we're going to define design in terms of change, because process in terms of change seems reasonable, because process is a kind of timey type thing. It's a timey-wimey stuff. But here, we've got the problem. 
How do I know that this is the right design for change? That classic observation, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. But my favorite thing about this quote is, I used to think this was a great quote, and I absolutely had it down as it was Niels Bohr, and certain por portions of the internet agree with me. But one of my co-authors on a um, couple of books wrote a few years ago on um, patent-oriented software architecture, um, he was convinced that it was Yogi Berra. You know what? There's a portion of the internet that agrees with him. And that was the one, you know, when you co-author books, you lose some, win some, etc., etc. However, I've since re-quoted it as this rather than Yogi Berra, and then did a little more investigation. It turns out we don't know. We actually don't know who said this. And what I love about this is the profound revelation that we have because we're talking about the past. Somebody said this in the past. We have no idea. How the hell are we going to do the future? Okay, This is a thing that's actually happened as opposed to a thing that might, may or may not happen. So rather than try and predict the future, we have a design approach. There is a methodology. This thing has been around for years. But a curious thing happened when this became popular. So this is 1999. Improving the design of existing code. So the, the main title, refactoring, yes, but it's the subtitle that's the most important and the most neglected. It's a design approach. It's not a code cleanup approach. It's a design approach. It's not a shortcut. It's not a kind of, ch -ch -ch, yep, I know refactoring. No, that's not, that's kind of like, yeah, it's a, like, a bit like me with a hammer saying, yep, I know woodwork. Okay? It's just that, no. So let's talk about this one. Because refactoring in one sense is about change, but for non-change. And this is where we start finding these interesting things. It's change to not change something. A change made to the internal structure of software to make it easier to understand. We're going to change something. To modify without changing. Ha-ha! Cunning. We got there. We're going to change without change. Which almost sounds like a Zen koan, but actually it's a daily practice. Now what is interesting, and strangely self-referential, is that this definition is identical in the second edition. So this didn't change, except that we went from Java to JavaScript. I, I offer you no judgment. I'm talking about languages later. So here's the thing. We can even classify the kinds of change. This is one of those things that I, I, try, I find, find is really helpful when we talk about, OK, what, what are the kinds of changes we're interested in? When I undertake change, what kind of change? I'm changing the code. OK, can I be more precise? I can change it along three not quite orthogonal axes, but you know what? These are not at right angles either. Functional, semantics, operational, which is basically how it runs, its use of memory, its use of time, okay? its availability, all of those things. And then developmental, the qualities on there, the developmental experience, the, what is the quality of the code, the quality of implementation, the habitability of the code, what's that like to work in? Now, people have a habit of lumping these two together and calling them non-functional, which is, I don't know, I'm on a minor crusade to stop us using that word, because that's a, words matter, especially when our job is to communicate meaning uh, to each other and through a compiler. Um, because, yes, indeed, they are non-functional, but that's, you know, that's not really very helpful. You know, there, there are lots of things, you know, it's like, I'm not Simon Maple, uh, you know, so... I'm a non-Simon Maple. Okay, our first keynote speaker will be non-Simon Maple. That tells you what I'm not, but it doesn't tell you what I am. Okay. But also, it, it's a word that already has a meaning. Non-functional. What, what, how do you expect, you know, if you wandered out into the streets of Islington and you asked random passers-by, who'd probably look at you kind of funny because it is a bit of an odd question. If I said to you, this is non-functional, how would you interpret that? Well, it's broken, isn't it, mate? Ah, ah, that's right, that's what non-functional means. It means it's not working. What are your non-functional requirements? <laughs> yeah, we want to crash. We want it to crash every Friday. Cool, we can arrange that for you. <laughs> non-functional, tick. But more importantly, we can understand a profile of change. We can start classifying the way that we work with something. What am I doing at the moment? I'm adding a feature. Okay, by definition, that means I'm moving along the functional axis, the semantic axis. This thing will now do stuff it did not do before. That big plus. 
What's going to happen to the performance stuff? Could go either way, could stay the same. It's not necessary to add a feature, it's not necessary that it do something. Obviously, we'd like it to be at least preserved, but it may not be critical, so maybe that doesn't matter. On the other hand, what, what about the developmental quality? Well, you know, same story. What about fixing a bug? That's surprisingly similar, actually, that one. But don't think of bugs as kind of like, oh, they're just like adding features. Down that path lies project management darkness. Do not go that route, because otherwise you end up prioritizing your bug fixes the same way that you prioritize your user stories. This is not good. This is very unhelpful and doesn't work for a variety of reasons. Partly because bugs we know very little about, and I know people say, oh yeah, but we don't really get our estimates for our user stories right yet. Have you tried estimating a bug? Because at least with a user story, I've got a first pass, I can estimate. Remember an estimate, it's not a commitment, it's not a prediction. So I think it's about this. I might be right, I might be wrong. A bug. I have no idea why it's there. Yeah, but how long is it going to fix? I have no idea because I didn't even know it was there until you told me it was there. Yeah, but how long is it going to take you to fix? I don't know, somewhere between five minutes and five months with a bias towards the shorter range because it actually turns out to have a really skewed distribution. But every now and then you meet somebody who's got those kind of like bags under their eyes, like, yeah, six months on a bug. <laughs> actually, I know somebody who did exactly that and they ended up rewriting it. Um, it was quicker. Um, Optimization. What are we doing with optimization? Semantics preserving. No change there. We are trying to improve one or more things along the operational axis. Developmental could go either way. Maybe, maybe complexity is added to our code as a result of optimization. On the other hand, maybe we get rid of some code and that simplifies it. So faster and less stuff. Cool. Refactoring. There we go. Refactoring. Again, semantics preserving. No change on the semantic axis, but we're going to change the developmental quality. We're going to improve something that is going to be good for the code. Yeah? Now, when we tend to think about this stuff, so what I've got here is not immediately obvious. I've got some stuff going on. I've got, yeah, I'm kind of using sort. And see myself. I've got myself kind of, uh, I've got myself an array list, and I'm kind of doing, oh, there it is, good, thank you. got myself an array list, I'm doing a sort, and then I'm doing a whole load of stuff. This feels very mechanical. I'm doing an awful lot of stuff here. It's very, very procedural, and there's things going on. Then it becomes a little bit clearer. Ah, oh, that's what I'm doing. I've sorted it, and now I'm going to remove the duplicates. Actually, that's not, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to extract this, remove the duplicates, and then I might say, actually, I'm going to rename that. Adjacent duplicates is actually technically what I'm doing. It turns out rename is, and you know this already, is the most popular um, uh, refactoring. For a lot of people, refactoring means rename. It begins with the same two letters. It's good enough. Okay, that's the, you know, this is the most popular. And we might say, okay, our work here is done, and we've already improved the code. We've done an extract method, that's cool. Extract method and a rename, nice. But you're not done yet, because sometimes change can be a little more, a little more creative. It's like, yeah, why don't I do that? That's a little bit easier. And there's no extracted out code. Okay, we stream it, we sort it, we uniquify it, bang, list, sorted, literally. And that's kind of nice, and some tools will do that for you. But you're not done, because refactoring is a much bigger picture, because sometimes, you know, the problem is it was already there in front of you. You didn't need Java 8. Oh, you want a collection with things that are unique and sorted. Huh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Funny, we have one of those. Yeah. And that, that's the whole point. It's a design process. It's not a, it's not a process of knowing everything in advance. It's the idea of like, sometimes the penny drops, maybe tomorrow, maybe next year, but it's just like, oh, now I see what we're doing. Of course, that's it. And so, not all of it's automated. So let's talk about the process. When do we do this stuff? We've got a we, same definition of process. That all works nicely. We can go back to the wisdom of the 19th century. Isabella Beaton, Book of Household Management, a book that, uh, she died incredibly young actually, but uh, the influence of her book lived on pff, kind of to at least mid 20th century. Um, and this is kind of like, it's a recipe book, it's a book about how to organize your house, how to organize your kitchens and all the rest of it. It made order out of disorder. And she told us back then, it was, a, it was actually a book on software management, cleverly disguised as a book on household management, there is no work like early work. Clear as you go, muddle makes more muddle. This is how commercial kitchens operate. 
not to wash plates and dishes soon after using makes more work. Now, the point here is that what she's talking about here is a process of doing small changes to preserve an absence of change. Your kitchen is always in a, in a good condition. Your code base is always in a good condition. How did it get like that? Did, by leaving it? No, by actively engaging in it. So, as an idea, refactoring actually goes back to the 1980s. Um, this is the original um, kind of, one of the most important um, PhDs that was written, uh, Bill Opdyke, who contributed a bit to the first refactoring book, um, submitted this in 1992, so 30 years ago. Um, Ralph Johnson, who is the same Ralph Johnson who was with Gang of Four Design Patterns. Um, it's where a lot of the original refactoring work was done um, uh, at uh, Urbana-Champaign. Um, and it was, there's a lot of stuff here. And he was talking about automated refactoring. Okay, he was talking about it in C++, which, funny enough, means that the, the language where it all started has ended up with the least love in this department. They went from C++ to Smalltalk and eventually Java became the place where it landed and matured in the marketplace. But here's the thing. The focus of the thesis is on automating the refactorings in a way that preserves the behavior of a program. It's the automation. And you know what? There was a feeling among some people when IDEs started appearing, you know, Automated refactorings, you know what this means. You realize what this means. One of the great things about languages, the modern ID support, is thanks to refactoring tools, legacy code is a thing of the past. Unlike, unlike with older languages, developers never have to experience long methods, rounding classes, poor identifier names, complex logic. For those of you who are young here, it must be so great to have never had to deal with legacy code. I am so envious of you. Now, I did actually have some people respond directly to this tweet rather than wait for the... <sighs> what did we do? How did we screw this one up? Because most of the problems that people complain about, and actually I was prompted to do that, partly because I, sat, I was sitting in all these workshops, staring at yet another Zoom screen, doing another code, it's just like... <sighs> but these problems, we have the magic wand. It's not like anybody, it's not like anybody, it's, oh, that's going to be tricky. No, it's right there. It's, it's there. Move to the top of the screen. There, refactor menu. And pull it down. That thing you're complaining about, done. That doesn't address everything, but wow, it clears the way. That long method that you experience on a daily basis and hate and lose buckets of time over, we actually solved that problem in the 1990s. Most of the problems that people are experiencing on a day-to-day, -day, but this is the thing that is quite shocking to me, most of the problems we experience on a day-to-day -day basis and complain about were solved in the last century. There are surprisingly few things that we have actually solved in the last few years that we're applying. It's just like, wow. But it also gives us a little bit of humility because maybe, maybe it wasn't a refactoring tool that was the problem. Maybe it wasn't the tools have nothing to do with it because it turns out it's a method or an approach to doing things. Maybe what we're missing is not the shortcut key. Wow, we've got lots of hammers, but how do you actually create decent furniture out of wood as opposed to more firewood? So this is the thing. We've, we still have many of the problems that we have, even though we have the technical solution so therefore, it actually isn't a technical problem, is it? Because we've just demonstrated, and we actually do this. It turns out for a variety of things. Is it possible to deliver, is it possible to create code with high test coverage? Uh, yeah, that's easy. You know, if your goal is to have 100% statement coverage, whew, that's a pretty low bar. It's trivial to create code with 100% statement coverage. This is a solved problem. It's called test-driven development. I first read, I, the earliest I've been able to trace any form of TDD, not called TDD, though, is the 1970s. This is a solved problem. If you want good coverage, that is a solved problem. We solve that. Let's move on to the things that are problems. People who do TDD don't tend to care about coverage very much. They kind of care it at the corner of their eye. Did it drop? Oh, yes, it did. Okay, that means I've got some dead code somewhere or something I've got. This is a solved problem. It's not even worth talking about. Yeah. Coverage is only interesting to people who don't do TDD. Yeah? It's like, ah, we solved that one, but we wrote ourselves into a corner. It's a people problem, not a technical problem. It turns out all of these things are us. We have met the enemy 
and he is us. So, that has not changed. This is why I'm so fascinated by old advice. If you go back and read Fred Brooks, Mythical Man Month, definitely a title from the 1970s, about a project in the 1960s, and you might go, oh my God, it was actually written about a project before there were, people had set foot on another world. How can that be relevant? Because it turns out that humans have, might not have changed very much since then. Yeah? We have not really evolved very much. So it turns out that the technology is part of the story, but we might be the other side of it. It turns out that learning things is the hard bit. The changing us is the hard bit. It turns out the technical bit was actually relatively easy. I'm not necessarily trivial, but was not the hard problem. Uh, Maya Manny Lehman in um, uh, 1980 observed, and as an evolving program is continually changed, its complexity reflecting deteriorating structure incle increases unless work is done to maintain or reduce it. Another example of change to not change. I need to keep changing stuff that's not to do with the core functionality in order to have no change in the perceived quality. It's kind of treading water. It turns out that a lot of the little changes that we do are to prevent big changes. In fact, it turns out we can learn from biology. That's what, you, that's what your body does, homeostasis. You wake up tomorrow morning, pretty much the same, unless you have a ridiculously good night tonight, you wake up tomorrow morning, pretty much the same shape as you are today with pretty much the same temperature, metabolism, all the rest of it, homeostasis. All the little changes that go to make up no change. Your body is constantly, dynamically exploring this. Now, that's kind of what we need to kind of think about when we think about not technology, but a socio-technical system, us and our code. I mean, I'm not going to say that we're like cyborgs and properly you know, melded with our code, um, although there are moments in the flow where I might feel like that. But the name for things, what is the name for things that resist change? The name for things that resist change is architecture. Um, Grady Butcher had this uh, observation. Architecture represents the significant design decisions that shape a system, where significant is measured by cost of change. So now we've defined architecture as change. It turns out that we're actually defining most of the things that we do in terms of change rather than stasis. And we say, oh, we don't have enough time to invest in this. We don't have enough time to maintain our architecture. We've just got to get on and deliver because somebody wants us to deliver functionality. It's just like, hmm, yeah, how's that going to work out for you? Because if you think good architecture is expensive, you just try bad architecture. <laughs> Turns out that we can actually substitute, for the word architecture, you can substitute thing that takes effort. If you think good thing that takes effort, is expensive, try bad thing that takes effort. I, you know, that's your template. You can use it next week and just plaster it all over. It can, that can be your unit test, that can be code reviews, that can be absolutely anything. And here's the thought. So this is taken from paper, Big Ball of Mud. I'm gonna refer back to that in a moment. Uh, another architecture book, this is definitely, you know, the, the, the ones that are actually architecture, architecture, these are nice books that you can kind of leave lying around now that we can have people around again. You can leave lying around and they instantly, people kind of look at those and go, wow, you're not just a software developer. You're kind of like, you know, charismatic, intelligent, cultured, well-read, you know, yeah. Okay, you don't have to actually open them, but, you know, if you do, there's more stuff on the inside. But if you just leave them around, it's just like wisdom by association, coolness by association. I have this book. Um, and a really important thing, sometimes people feel, like, oh, is architecture a good metaphor for software? Because architecture doesn't change. <laughs> yes, it does. It just changes at a different time scale. The change is a different, different speed of change. In it, Stuart Brand builds on the work of Frank Duffy when talking about rates of change. He says a number of buildings, this would be a good example, office buildings or another, homes not so much. They have different rates of change. There are different, there are different demands that are fairly predictable. The physical location of a site generally doesn't ch of a building generally doesn't change. Yeah, every now and then people will move a building. Every now and then an earthquake will move a building. But generally, this is the most stable part. The load-bearing structure is the next most stable. The facade has a life cycle for office buildings of around 20 to 30 years. The services, 5 to 15 years. That's your lighting, your cabling, your air conditioning, all this kind of stuff, and so on. The stuff that you move around, chairs and tables, they can be, those can be moved around on an hourly or daily basis. So why don't we build a building that allows us to do those easily? Which basically is a fancy way of saying, don't put plumbing in your load-bearing walls. But we can do the same with software. Oh, but when, with software, don't take this too literally. Don't wander in Monday, Monday morning, go like, 
Okay, folks, we're doing a, a 6S architecture because there are S's. I saw it, in, I saw it in, in, in a talk last week. No, don't do it too literally. It's the, it's the idea of it. In the big ball of mud paper, Brian and Joe put this up as shearing layers. It's been observed in a number of systems, legacy systems. Different artifacts change at different rates. Therefore, factor your system so that artifacts that change at similar rates are together. We can actually use change positively to structure. In other words, we're actually looking at the past to learn about the future. And this is an important point Adam Tornhill made. And if you haven't come across this book, it's got a great title as well as great content. Your code is a crime scene. Use forensic techniques. It's just like, it makes you sound way cool. It's like, are you a software developer? Or are you a forensic scientist? Oh, I want to be forensic scientist, please. That sounds way cooler. So the point here, there's a lot of good code analytics here. Measuring change frequencies is based on the idea that code has, that has changed in the past is likely to change again. We are using a statistical approach. We're not trying to predict the future. We are trying to forecast it based on basically, well, <laughs> this keeps changing. OK, I'll give that a reasonable probability. It's not a guarantee, but it turns out that we can use the great thing about legacy systems is they have a past. They have a history. It's just we need to spend a little longer looking at it and treat it as a source of information, not just as a source of anxiety that we put behind us and hours and hours of therapy to get through. Or maybe that's just me. But that's the point. There is a whole load of stuff we are not interrogating this for. We can get so much information. It's an information system in its own right. Now, on that, I'm just going to take a detour into crap vocabulary that we use. Words that we use that devalue what we're doing. Repo sounds cool because it's like two syllables. It's got kind of associations with Repo Man, if you're into 1980s cult movies. If you're not, got more homework this weekend. It sounds, it's kind of cheap and abbreviated, and it's just like, yeah, repository. What's that mean? It's literally where I place where I put stuff. I mean, that's not the best Latin translation you're ever going to find, but place where I put stuff. Really? Was that the best we could do? You know, it's just, yeah, I don't use a version control system. I use a place where I can put stuff. Yeah, you know, it's that, that classic thing. Yeah, put it in Latin, sounds cooler. Okay, so what should we call these things? So I think the term repo devalues what it is. It doesn't make it sound like here is a wealth of information about how you develop. That's the place you put stuff. Now, we could call it version control. Yeah, it, it does do that, but it's, the emphasis is in completely the wrong place. It's not about controlling versions at all. It's about remembering things. You can use a version control system. Now it sounds a bit circular. You can use a version control system to do version control, but that's not necessary. You can just use it to keep all your changes. I mean, for God's sakes, I mean, we've really missed a trick here. It's a bloody time machine. Or if you're feeling particularly sharp, and this is such a wasted opportunity, it's a difference engine. Okay? That is, that is, the, great, that is the great missed opportunity of 20th, 20th century naming on 19th century technology. That, oh, I'm going to put it in the repo. Let me consult. My, at this point, you put on appropriate kind of steampunk gear. I shall consult the difference engine. I shall travel back to the past. I shall retrieve the knowledge that you, you, yes, you have, yeah, whatever. There's a lot here. So while we're on diagrams, I'm going to take this quote from Melvin Conway, 1968. This observation that it's timeless, and yet it's all about time. There's never enough time to do something right, but there's always enough time to do it over. I've seen this attributed to various people in the 21st century, but no, this one I can tell you because I've, you know, this is a paper worth reading. It's very short. It's only about four pages long. It's where Conway's law comes from. It's that Conway. So here's a thought. This is all about time. That's what we're, that's what we're dealing with. The thing that surprises us and the thing that we struggle with is, is the passage of time. And, and what does that do for us? How, do, how can we tell the past? How do we tell the future? Well, so there's been a bunch of 97 Things books. I contributed to the first one, which is 97 Things Every Software Architect Should Know. And I've edited two others, 97 Things Every Programmer Should Know. And then I'm actually losing track of the years. Two years ago, um, uh, Trisha G and I finished 97 Things Every Java Programmer Should Know. Um, but in this, this one, which is the first in the series, one of the pieces that I've put in, and I've since put it on my blog and extended it, is use uncertainty as a driver. No, we can't predict the future. 
we can use past behavior, but we can also actually use that feeling of discomfort that we might have. I'm really not sure about this. Okay, that sounds important. It sounds like it might be something that could change. If you're not certain about something, that's a forward indicator of volatility. You can actually design around that. I actually did this with a team. It's just like every time one of them said, yeah, we don't know what we're going to do there, I'd draw a line. It's like, what? I just drew a line. I said, well, you don't know about it, so let's, let's put a, an interface or a boundary. It's something architecturally significant here. Because we don't know what's there, we're going to have something, but you don't want this bit we know about to depend on the thing you don't know about. That would be bad. So let's put a boundary in there. That's what this, so this is not, this is not domain-driven design. This is uncertainty-driven design, which strangely has not caught on. Ud. You know, but we can, we can do that. But there's an idea here. The very fact that you don't know something is itself interesting. The fact that there are alternative possibilities, that's interesting. In fact, that's design level interesting. It's a forward indicator of change. Again, there's nothing new about this. I take no credit. This is Parnas, David Parnas, 1972. We propose one begins with a list of difficult design decisions or design decisions which are likely to change. Each module is then designed to hide such a decision from the others. It's a really simple idea. Everybody thinks this is to do with the private keyword. No, it's actually bigger than that. It's actually a much deeper idea. The very fact you're not sure about something is constructive information. The fact that it might change is itself important. So let's go back to Melvin Conway. The misunderstood Conway's law. It's a lot of good stuff here. Basic thesis is that organizations which design systems are constrained to produce designs which are copies of the communication structures of these organizations. Okay, in other words, there's, there's the force, how people communicate will influence what they build, which sounds nowhere near as good as that, but it does get the idea. It's, a, it's an unsurprising idea. Now, what Conway was proposing says we found a criteria for structuring, for the structuring of design organizations. A design effort should be organized according to the need for communication. That's what he said. A lot of people have ended up calling this, bizarrely enough, the reverse Conway maneuver because they didn't read the original paper. Again, that's your homework. It's four pages long. It's not that hard. Read it, and then you go, oh, OK, that was pretty cool for 1968 when we had not yet put a person on another, one other world. You know, it's, and if you want more context, by the way, Melvin Conway invented the co-routine in 1958. So... I find this a little bit disturbing because I, I ran across a blog post last week talking about new technologies, co-routines. 1958, yeah, okay, that's not new. The point here is that he was originally proposing this, but we observe it as an observation for legacy systems. It tells us something about it. Now, this is where it gets really interesting. So, the, this whole idea is that we are essentially programming, you know, there's, there's a whole point here about the forces that shape our code. And it's not just the forces of our existing relationships. It's the force of past relationships. The past is never dead, it's not even past. It turns out that most of the time, we are programming in the past. We are shaped by what went before us. And this was made incredibly clear and this paper, uh, which is definitely worth, I only came across it last year, I, I know the author, Rob Smallsher, and he doesn't shout about this paper enough, it's really important. Um, it's got the catchy title, it is embedded in the URL, um, Predictive Models of Development Teams and Systems They Build. And what he's done is he's trying to look about, well, what's about, what about the influence of those developers who are no longer on, on the code base? I mean, you know, you leave and then that's your influence done. No, it isn't. So just using simulation-based stuff, he's talking about this idea that even 20 years after, 20 years after, if you are on this team, you're only working, with, and he's assuming constant team size, only 20% of the code was produced by the current team. And that's for, how long did that team last? Well, I'll get back to that in a moment. That's kind of interesting. 10 years, five years, for five years, it's, the original, you are mostly not working, you know, as if, and if you join that team, you won't be working on anything that looks familiar. And most of your colleagues won't have worked on it either. So that's what Rob did in this paper. He simulated the effect, in this particular case, seven developers, or rather a seven, no, my mistake, a team of seven, but ultimately 19 developers over a five-year period. And this whole idea of, like, what's their long-term contribution? Where there's a little black line and a shift in the hue, of the color, that means that's the code, it lives on. We never really die, okay? Lives on, 
and it exerts a force on you. So there's a whole concept, as Rob put it, he said the state, the state of the system reflects not only the organization, but the organizational history and the flow of people through those organizations over the long term. As he said, what I mean is that the structure of the software reflects the organizational structure integrated over time. I remember reading this and going, like, oh my God, time is, how, how do we miss this? We were so excited by the possibility of people, I mean, these days particularly, I must say, it's like, hello, um, the, the whole possibility of people and actually seeing them in 3D. Um, the pixels on you are amazing, by the way, I've got to say that. Um, that we forgot the time dimension. It's just like, oh yeah, it's not just the present. It is all the people that were on that, that their influence is incredibly strong. And Rob also included this rather interesting thing um, uh, on uh, half-lives, and I'll get back to lambdas in a minute. Um, half-lives, absolutely fascinating in years. <laughs> Developers are at the short end. Okay, half-lives, not averages, it basically means, you know, it's like decay, you know, it's how, much does it, how long does it take before half the stuff, half have moved on. So developers last a lot less, a lot less time than CEOs. Uh, CEOs last less time than lines of code. Your, uh, if your company's in the FTSE 100, it's going to last longer than most of that. But by God, these classes and modules, they stick around forever. You know, and that's a really interesting example because that gets you that homeostasis again. Because how do lines of code change faster than classes? How does that work? Well, in the same way that I'm fairly sure that most of what I am now is not what I was when I was born. You know, there might be one or two atoms, but that might be, you know, it's, they've, all, they've moved on to better places and people. That's the whole thing. The body is a permanent ship of Theseus. It's a permanent set of changes with minimal change. It's like, okay, how do we change to not change? So on this, let's again talk about people and technology. So has anybody seen this curve? This is the technology uh, adoption life cycle curve. Does anybody know where it came from? Because you kind of get so used to seeing it, it just becomes part of what people talk about. It's the, it's the, I first came across it in Jeffrey Moore's Crossing the Chasm, but that's not where it originates. You just get so used to it, so I thought I'd dig around. It turns out it's actually agriculture, 1950s. Because there's a misunderstanding here. And people often like to say, okay, you've got the innovators, the early adopters, the early majority, late majority, and laggards. And there's something about the word in English, laggard, that sounds really just like, oh, it sounds slow. Even if you didn't know what it meant, it's laggards. It's not a fast word. You don't want to be the laggard here. And the, Jeffrey Moore kind of came along and said, you know what, there's a bit of a chasm here. Getting from there to, yeah, interesting, but not what we're talking about. I want to talk about the fact that we've been misunderstanding this. And in fact, what was even better is when I was digging around for this, the very site I took this from, which I've credited, the very site I got it wrong, or rather misunderstood it. Number of adopters, yes. Technology matures. No. No, this is not about technology. It's a technology adoption. It's not a technology maturation. There, you can have the same crap for years and it can get worse and this curve still applies. It's whether the market matures. This is not about the technology. The technology may indeed mature, but that's, that's not a necessary precondition for this. It's, nothing, it's not measuring that at all. This is how, and that's the whole thing. The 1950s observation was how do certain agricultural practices diffuse against a population of farmers? It's about how knowledge propagates. It's how acceptance propagates. It's, it's the human stuff. It's nothing to do with whether technology gets better or matures. Maybe it does, but maybe it doesn't. Then there's different graphs for that. So the point here is this is a curve about people, not a curve about technology. It's a curve about, <laughs> there's a lot of people that don't like change, and we knew that. So let's talk about a couple of the changes. It's kind of heading the home straight. Tybee index, people familiar with that? Okay, it's got various, okay, so, you know, popular, most popular programming languages, all this kind of stuff, and then there, there's another one, Redmonk, they both have completely different methodologies. Um, I'm not going to say one is more or less right than the other, I'm just interested in, here's a reasonably quasi-rational way um, of confirming your prejudices or telling everybody that the world's stupid and doesn't choose the right tech, you know, whichever way, you know, it's just some kind of confirmation bias exercise, but they have a bit of methodology to it. What I find absolutely fascinating 
is that, particularly with the Red Monk one, you kind of go across it and it's just like, you know, most of these languages are kind of old. So, Tyobi on the left, Red Monk on the right. Okay, it's a bunch of languages. You're kind of going through. Okay, so let's let's tidy this one up a bit. I'm going to make I'm going to make a master list. So uh, the first one, first one I'm going to consolidate. Is I'm getting rid of classical um, uh, uh, Visual Basic. I'm just saying it's Visual Basic all the way down. I would make a distinction for VBA if it were in the in the top 20, but it isn't. Um, but no, I'm not going to make that distinction here. I don't think that's a valuable one. The next one I'm doing is I'm getting rid. I'm consolidating. If there are any Object Pascal users who are doing who are not using Delphi. Um, you can, you know, yeah, I mean, <laughs> I'll buy them a drink, okay? It's, it's, not, it's not a distinction even worth making, okay? So, getting rid of that. Um, I'm also going to get rid of assembly and shell. Those aren't languages, those are language categories. I'm also going to get rid of um, CSS and SQLs. Um, that's, they're two very... They're DSLs, and CSS is not computationally complete. And before anybody sends me the link that says, yes, they are computa it is computationally complete, no, it's not. CSS plus HTML plus events. But apparently, HTML doesn't qualify in the top 20, bizarrely. OK, we've got it. OK, now we are going to uniquify it, but I'm not going to sort them, so I won't use the earlier algorithm. This is a list of non-duplicates. Let's just sh shove them in and resize. OK, you've got 23 languages there. 23 languages, um, a quarter of which you can run on the JVM, which is kind of interesting. A lot of other interpreted stuff and a reasonable representation of native languages. Now I'm going to reorder them. I'm reordering these by time. Huh. So this century is definitely less, much less than a half. Okay, that's kind of interesting. These are the languages that are most widely used as synthesized by these um, two um, surveys. But it gets even more interesting when I just include the ones that made it to a top 10. There are, by coincidence, 10 languages here. Two of them were invented this century. We are programming in the past. Yeah, I work in technology, it's really fast moving. No, it isn't. So. I said I'd get to Lambdas. Lambdas? Alonzo Church, 1932. Okay. Although the paper that was credited with it really interesting was 1936, solution to the Inscheidungs problem. And it also showed us a form of data abstraction. The late William Cook wrote this in 2009, made the very astute observation that Lambda calculus was the first object oriented language. <laughs> So it always gets me when people say, oh, I'm doing pro functional programming. Why? Because I'm using lambdas. No, that's not how it works. Lambdas are object oriented. In fact, this, when we look at the adoption, and this, you know, if you've not come across fields arranged by purity, XKCD, you know, so for those of you, you know, there we go, purity, purity, yeah, psychology is just applied biology, <laughs> physicists, because like, yeah, it's good to be on top, mathematicians, oh, hey, didn't notice you guys. Let's just repurpose that one here. Yeah, Java 2014. Yeah, we were in the internet, man. Yeah, C++ before everybody else, before, before, before. Small talkers going like, yeah, we knew this. Yeah, it's back to the 70s and 80s. Lisp is just like, yeah. The point is, this has been around for ages. And to quote the wisdom of Jean-Luc, change always comes later than we think it should. We are very, very slow in certain parts. If you like, there are parts of technology that do indeed move fast, but a remarkable amount is change-averse to a degree that is astonishing when you actually take a look at it. So let's go back. Let's close with technology. We said technology. Yeah, we do change. Yeah. Dijkstra back in 72. To put it quite bluntly, as long as there were no pro machines, programming was no problem at all. <laughs> It's just like, you know what, you're right. And he says, and they've got more and more power. It's just like, yeah. It's not, an, it's, not, it's, not a, it's not a precondition for change. Um, and it doesn't necessarily guarantee an easy life. When we talk about progress, we, we mistakenly, 
working from home was not, it was a great experiment, but the real life, real life stuff is really good. However, what we have learned is that we can do it and therefore we have a choice. So now what we have is this challenge where some people who really don't want change want to just go back and say, you're either always going to do this or you're always going to do this. And it's just like, you know, that's kind of like a, that's a false dichotomy. At this point, I should quote Yoda and stuff about this because there's a whole point. You're seeing things in black and white. This is very Sith. It's that this somewhere in the middle. It turns out that the change that we have learned is that we have a choice. Disruption. When we use the term correctly, okay, Clayton Christensen in the mid-90s was talking about disruptive innovation. The bit we... And it's the sound of one hand clapping. Everybody picked up on disruptive because it sounds cool. But there's a cycle. There's another kind of innovation that he was talking about. But, you know, sustaining innovation really doesn't have the same kind of like, you know, what are we going to do? We're going to sustain! It's like, if you're a guitarist, this is absolutely fantastic. Great sustain is something that you're after. But really, disruption sounds way sexier. We're going to sustain stuff. Mm, you know? And what he was saying is that this is how, there's a thought, there's another side to this. Sound of one hand clapping. No, you put the two together. That you find one inside the other. So on that observation, hopefully I've given you some thoughts, maybe even some numbers. There is this point that change is always going to be there. We are not always going to be on the right side of it. We sometimes resist change more than we probably should. We sometimes embrace it more than we probably should. And therefore, all the rest is the fun, is figuring out how much change do I accommodate. The fact that there is change is not the choice. It's the degree to which we embrace it or not. I don't know if that's a good intro to the weekend or just a thought for the pub, but I hope it's given you at least a thought. Thank you very much.